how are you? I'm good, thank you. How are you? I'm good. You are so nice coming on to chat to me, Naomi. I'm so excited. I don't watch anything on any social media platform apart from your videos. Oh, that is so lovely. So funny. Did you work out how to TikTok yourself? Oh my God. I, Naomi, I was a chief operations officer for a software company. And then lockdown oh. happened. Lockdown happened. And then I just lost my shit and then ended up doing TikTok videos and left my job. Oh, did you? <laughs> Amazing. You look so beautiful and a tunnel. Thank you. Thank it's you. So I'm constantly told by my family it's too dark, but I like it. No, <laughs> if you are watching this today, do me a favor and go and follow Dr. Naomi. Potter, she has dedicated her entire career to empathetic menopause care. She is also a British Menopause Society accredited specialist doctor. I didn't even know that was a thing. I didn't even think that there were menopause doctors. I really, really didn't. Not only that, she's founded her own menopause clinic where you can book on for an online appointment or a face-to-face -face appointment. Not only that, but you're also now an award-winning author. I'm best-selling author with Davina McCall. It still feels like a bit of a dream. You have been a very busy lady, Naomi, and I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to answer this question for me. What is perimenopause? So perimenopause is the lead up to menopause and it's very gray. It isn't a line in the sand. It's very hard to diagnose, yeah. but it can, be, it, can last for, it can last for years and it can even last for a decade. And it's that time of hormonal turbulence where your ovaries are not in their kind of tip-top youthful condition and they sputter into life and they spurt out a bit of hormone and then they go quiet. And that's why that's why symptoms can kind of come and go because it's not a static, uh, it's not a static picture, it's real hormonal turbulence. And it's why women have the most kind of strong and severe symptoms in that in that phase rather than when they're postmenopausal because their body just doesn't really know kind of what which way is up just growing up it was obviously an ignorance in me thinking that menopause was for women in their 50s and their 60s and it was called the change and it was all associated with hot flushes and really really ignorant outlook at it um and not being educated enough so whenever i started to have these symptoms it was more the fear of what was happening to me and worrying that there was something either a clinically wrong and then be mentally wrong which once those two words collide shit starts to get scary can do like i've had panic attacks i've had um palpitations i've had bouts of depression i've had anxiety and it's not as scary to me anymore it is getting worse as i get older but i just need to work harder to manage it but what really makes me feel for women who have never suffered with anxiety or ever had panic attacks before or any depression is hitting their mid-30s and then all of a sudden it happens and it's like is it perimenopause? Is it, is that the reason for it? Or is it something else underlying that's making all of these women all of a sudden come out in their droves in their mid thirties and say, I'm really struggling mentally here. I think it depends. I mean, I don't, feel, I don't think every single one of those women are going to be perimenopausal. I think that, you know, life, life in your late thirties can be challenging. You know, you've got yeah. young children or you know children at school doing difficult things at school or you've got older parents or maybe you're at the peak of your career or having a career change you know things yeah. things aren't necessarily easy and I think those those things in themselves can cause and can cause anxiety um and and low mood uh, but there will be a proportion of those women who, without a shadow of a doubt, will be perimenopausal and they will be the ones that would respond, that you need to treat. It's not just that they would respond to treatment, but if you have a woman in her 30s who's not got enough oestrogen, then yeah. her bones and cardiovascular system are at risk. I haven't been diagnosed by my doctor clinically as being on perimenopause. I have self-diagnosed myself based on a number of symptoms. So what 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 do what does a woman do 
in those instances? Symptoms are the most important thing. So if you have typical symptoms, um, which or not even necessarily typical symptoms, but, but symptoms that we recognize as being associated with the perimenopause, that is the that is your your the crux of your of your diagnosis. And that can be anything. It doesn't have to be hot flushes and night sweats. It can be any of the 60 odd symptoms that um, that we, we understand are, are connected to perimenopause. And then if you're young, so if you're under the age of 45, we would do blood tests. Um, we do a group of blood tests to exclude other causes. And that's really important because there are other, other uh, conditions that can mimic perimenopause. So that would be to look at things like thyroid function, your full blood count, kidney function, liver function, vitamin D, other vitamins, um, and to make sure that you're not deficient in anything and that there's not something else that needs treating. And we would also look at a, a hormone profile, um, which which sometimes tells us where you are. But because hormones are all over the place, it's easier if you've got if you've got a typical so if you've got a typical menopausal picture, which would be where you're where there's a hormone that your brain pumps out called follicle stimulating hormone, and as it has to, as your brain has to work harder to get your ovaries to do anything, that hormone level goes up. So if you've got a high FSH, say over 30, then that would indicate that your ovaries are not responding to the, to the, the signals that your FSH is, um, is, is, telling, is telling you. Um, and if your estrogen level or your estradiol level is low, that's, that also kind of feeds into that diagnosis. But often you haven't got those. So you can have a normal FSH and you could have a normal estradiol. And the, one of the problems is that it's normal. To, it's the, the range of the normal range of estradiol is so big that they all the results come back as normal. OK, so it can be hard to make that diagnosis. But if you don't find any other cause and you've got symptoms that are typical of the perimenopause, even if your blood tests are normal, then there is an argument for starting something like HRT, if that's what a woman wants, to see whether that makes a difference. And if your symptoms resolve with HRT, you've got your diagnosis. So in terms of HRT, then say you were successful, and you got your diagnosis and you started HRT. What are the pros and cons? So if you're young, so if you're, you know, in an early menopause, um, the, the pros very, very much outweigh any risks. There isn't really any risk to replacing hormones under the age of under the age of 50. Um, but the benefits are you uh, bone density, primarily bone density. So it will protect your bones from that bone loss that occurs when estrogen, when estrogen goes, but also cardiovascular protection. Um, so uh, vessel, healthy vessels like estrogen and estrogen keeps them in really good condition and without it over time uh, vessels can deteriorate there's other there's other advantages so things like metabolic advantages um the way that your body processes sugar and um and lipids so fats cholesterol um there's thought to be advantages to do with skin health muscle health joints um hair um oh, this is like an advertisement i'm like I look at food, I put on weight. My skin's terrible. Hair loss, hair growth in places that it shouldn't be growing in. Everything that I've read about HRT, I'm like, this could help. But I can't get it right now. This moment in time, I can't get it because I haven't been diagnosed. So if you are young, so if you're, especially if you're under the age of 40, then I mean, in, certainly in, in England, um, you would be referred to a specialist centre where they would, you know, probably do even more blood tests um, to, to see if there's an underlying cause. So even if you've got normal hormones, we would want to know whether there was something else that was going on that was affecting your ovaries. But it's really, I mean, it, it is, it's a... Um, so early menopause and POI, um, which is where you have a very, very early menopause, um, are, you know, they they, they need treating properly you need to be under a doctor it's not for a gp to treat really okay um you need to be um under a doctor that knows what they're doing because otherwise all sorts of things can go wrong for example well you can have hrt but you can only have hrt for five years well that's no good because that means that you're you know you finish your hrt at 42 that's you know that's not what we should be doing you should be offered bone scans um you should be offered um, looking into the reasons why why this may have happened. So there's all sorts of things that need to happen, and you can't really expect a GP to 
to, to understand or to know that it is specialist stuff. There are so many people asking why GPs aren't taking it seriously. Do you feel for GPs in that sense that they're getting such a bad rap and people are like, that doctor doesn't care about me? You know, it must be hard because they don't specialise in that area, but there's no funding to actually estab establish menopause specialists. It's, it's really hard. And I was speaking to somebody last week whose daughter has just qualified from medical school in the UK in 2023. And she received one slide's worth of training on the menopause for her entire medical training. And she's going to be a doctor now. And she's out seeing patients and expected to identify something that is going to happen to 50% of the population with one slide's worth of training. And that's still the case. So GPs who are out there now, if the only they are, they would be very lucky if they've received any formal training on the menopause. They may have elected to undertake it themselves, but then they're, they're busy people. They've just come yeah. through COVID. You know, there's all sorts of updates in the whole in, in the whole spectrum of medicine to update themselves with. It's it's really hard. And there's also, I think, unfortunately, a bit of a backlash now against menopause. So five years ago, when nobody was talking about it, everybody kind of wanted to learn about it. Whereas now there's a bit of menopause fatigue. And I think there are there are a, a group of people who think that it's a media frenzy, that really it's um, you know, it's a trend. And trend. And, and so they use that as a reason to not be interested, which I'm very, very much against. But um it's hard it is hard being a gp is really really hard really hard so i do i do feel for them and i do, i also think fundamentally you know the vast 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 majority of, of of doctors want to do the right thing by their patients and they've and they are still carrying that hangover from the early 2000s well everybody thought that hrt was not safe and that if you give somebody, if you give a young woman a prescription for HRT and they get breast cancer, it's your fault. And that's what they're thinking. So they're, they're reluctant in their kind of emotional reluctance is because they're just not up to date and they're not confident and comfortable. Okay, so some facts and myths for you, Naomi. First up, you can increase your chances of breast or ovarian cancer. So the modern the modern HRT that we use, so the estrogen through the skin, and in most cases it's a, it's called a body identical progesterone called eutrogestan, a micronized progesterone, um, is if it does increase your risk of breast cancer, it is by the tiniest, tiniest amount. We don't have a lot of data for those products. Um, themselves, we've got we've got data for the old more old fashioned um products but our our suspicion is that they that probably the breast cancer risk is either neutral or just a tiny tiny bit up um for women taking estrogen on its own there is a lot of evidence to suggest that that can actually reduce your risk of breast cancer um and certainly drinking two glasses of wine a night would put your risk of breast cancer up by far more than hrt would and this doesn't apply to women under the age of 50 either so this is all in this is all in older women so we we think that if anyone under the age of 50 is on hrt it's not going to affect their risk of breast cancer at all. Okay, what about family history? Would that affect the risk? Your own genetic, so your own genetics will influence what your risk of breast cancer is. But there's nothing anybody can do about that. It is what you, what you are. The thinking is that any HRT that you take above that risk, that family history risk, is probably not going to influence that risk further. So if you've got a very strong family history of breast cancer and you then take HRT, it's not a cumulative risk. You're not kind of you're not expanding that risk yes. to a greater level. Yes, your risk of breast cancer is going to be higher, but it's not um, nothing to do with the HRT. OK, okay. Um, factor myth. I think you've touched on this already. And this is from some information, again, conflicting from what I've researched. Perimenopause symptoms will last roughly three or four years from a few months to three or four years. That's that's about right. And yeah, then shorter, another right? article said from a few months to 14 years. <laughs> 14 years is well, the, the thing is that you can your menopausal symptoms, if you're unlucky, will continue. So you can have hot flushes in your 80s. Perimenopause is a sign of infertility. So you don't need contraceptive. Fact or myth, Naomi? That is a myth. Please use contraception if you don't have <laughs> contraception. <laughs> 
will tell my husband that I'm telling you. Um, only a doctor can confirm if you are in perimenopause. You cannot self-diagnose. Well, I think women have a very good idea about what's going on with their bodies. Uh, I've never met a woman who said, you know what, I really think I'm in perimenopause. I can't think of another explanation and then been proved wrong. I mean, okay. You cannot get HRT or hormone therapy until your periods have stopped for at least 12 months. That's a, that is a complete, that is a complete and utter myth. Fact or myth, menopause is worse than perimenopause. <laughs> it's different for everyone. It's different for everyone. If you, if so, if you ask me, my clinic is filled with women in the perimenopause turbulence. You can get these, you can, you get women to kind of sorted if they're going to take HRT and then they're better. Women in menopause are better because you've not got a moving yeah. target underneath. Um, so if you're in, if you're postmenopausal and you are not on HRT, then some women will have a, will have a tough time because they're completely without estrogen, but it's the turbulence that seems to be the, well, it certainly in terms of people that seek our help. Yes. Um, that those really struggle i find it, it it's strange i don't know if you noticed i, I, I it's an actually a part of my recent stand-up show i talk about if you talk about perimenopause um or near a woman who's in full bone menopause they straight away are like <laughs> no you say anything about perimenopause and all the women that are in full blown menopause be like just you it was <laughs> Eve, no idea. It's like we're not in the full menopause club, so we can't complain. Like, in our defense, we have all the symptoms and we still have our period. You are on HRT, writing whenever you want. Rolling about the place, roller skating in white shorts and all. Not worrying about anything. We still have our periods. I'm fed up of it. These are probably women who grew up um, and menopause was just the change at a certain time. But then I'm like, did they go through their 30s and 40s? Because there had to have been. Is this a generational thing? Are there more women in perimenopause now because, you know, our diets have changed and additives or has it always been a thing? I think it's always been a thing and it's just that nobody's ever identified it as such and they've, and they've just put it down to... Women. That is such an old prehistoric thing, but it's, I think as women and those older generations began to believe that themselves. And that is so sad because I know how much so many women are struggling at the perimenopause stage. There's the caricature of those, old, of, of those older women, you know, the granny sat in the corner. Um, Sweat. And it's, yeah, it, and this, you know, slightly scatty older lady um it's yeah it's it's not on i know it's mad and it is going to take a long time to change it but hopefully now it is something that thanks to you and what you're doing like is there a way for the nhs in the future obviously there's not going to be much funding for it now but in the future to refer patients into you and clinics like yours specialist yeah. menopause clinics there are there are already specialist menopause clinics. Mm -hmm. Yep. And um yeah, so certainly in I don't know about the facilities in Northern Ireland, but um but in England there are, I mean, there's not that many. There's not that right. many, but they do have um that they, they do exist. Uh and I think as time goes on, like you know, when I when I was still practicing as a GP, we would have a, spe a specialist diabetics clinic and a specialist high blood pressure clinic within our practice surgery. And I think that will be the way it goes, but it's going to take some time. It is. And it's going to get the right people trained as well. So it's all well and good calling yourself a you know, saying you've got a menopause doctor in your clinic. But we've had patients come to us and say, well, I've seen my menopause doctor or my menopause nurse and they didn't have a clue. And oh. um, it, it is definitely changing. Is there a male alternative to these fluctuations in hormones? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think there is definitely a hormonal decline in men. Um, it is not my area of expertise. Mm -hmm. um, but um, but I, th I think there probably is that, that hormonal, that gradual hormonal decline, but it's not a falling off a cliff. Mm. Typically, like it can be in women. Okay. I think that's, that's the difference. 
um you just have to suck it up perimenopause is what it is just suck it up but it isn't because there are things that can be done whether that's hormones or non-hormones there are always things that can be done i mean i th i think that's a fact in the sense that Unfortunately, there are an awful lot of women out there who are having to suck it up because they have no access to any help. But I don't think it should be. I don't think it should be the expectation. That's the. That's where it's whether it's true, or whether it's a fact or, or yeah. a myth or not. So for women that aren't in the process of you know having access to being referred into a menopause clinic, what could they do holistically right now in terms of vitamins or any kind of activities? lots that can be done holistically and HRT or other medications that we use for targeted treatments in, in the perimenopause they are not the full that's it's not it's not a silver bullet you have to look after yourself and it's it's slightly cliche I always feel slightly when I say it but it is true um so the first thing is is exercise movement getting outside not punishing yourself with a marathon but you know doing something that you enjoy even if that's just going for a walk in a forest, um, but getting outside in fresh air and getting sweaty and breathless if you can, but it's just about moving. Um, diet is really important. If you eat a whole load of refined, stodgy carbohydrates and sugar, that high sugar, then it's not gonna make you feel very well. In fact, it's gonna end up causing you to spiral and into, into the kind of self-medicating insulin spikes, hypoglycemic crashes, and you end up going Guilty. <laughs> Coffee is is terrible. <gasps> uh, is it? Yeah, awful. Uh, anxiety provoking, sleep interrupting, um, stimulant that is massively powerful. Some women are more some some people are more sensitive than others. But if you can eliminate coffee, I know it sounds very dull, um, but it can make a massive massive difference. Um, and the same with alcohol. So. I know again, it's super dull. <laughs> I can feel people throwing darts at my face. <laughs> but it really makes a difference. Um, and if you just give it three weeks of stopping alcohol and stopping coffee, then some women just, just feel completely free of symptoms because the anxiety that comes around with the, so the coffee, the coffee cycle, because everybody, if you have coffee, you tend to drink it every day. So you have coffee in the morning, even if you only have one cup in the morning, you've got adrenaline running through you higher than you would have done for the rest of the day, then you can't sleep. So you have broken or interrupted or shortened sleep, then the next day you're exhausted. So you have your coffee to start. And then you get round, you go round and round in circles. And the same with alcohol. So you are, um, you feel anxious, so you drink alcohol, so you don't sleep properly, so you have that middle of the night alcohol anxiety, so you spend the whole of the rest of the day knackered and anxious, and so you have half a bottle of wine before you go to bed, and then you go, you end up going round and round and round in a, in a spiral. And they're two really, really simple, simple things that with no, with nothing else, yeah. if you just stop those two things, it can make a massive difference. And I think we all know deep down, <laughs> if we packed it on, for a couple of weeks we would actually feel you know different and better and healthier and some of those symptoms reduce but it is it's i think that's the hardest part is actually that self-awareness you know and sometimes it's easier to be like no no just give me a pill give me something and i can still have my coffee and i can still have my wine just give me something that's going to help me as we get older we do we have to sacrifice the nice stuff I think you crave those things and you view them as the nice things because you're not feeling well. Yes. And actually, life would be the nice stuff if you only felt well and you wouldn't need those things in order to get that joy. And I don't think that's a big shock or surprise to anybody. It's, it's like we all know, we know, we know we need to do this stuff. Um, let me see if I did another. Very popular when I'm the one telling you. It's like, oh god, this. Imagine is... everybody's looking at you like. But everything in moderation. I think you learn that. I, I, I think once you get into your thirties, you know you've gone past the stage of being in your twenties and partying, and you're starting to wind down. And then your thirties, you like your comforts, you like your wine, and and you like your coffee, and you like your refined sugars a lot, and you're nice and calm and comfortable. But it, it's at times for me personally, it's not worth it. It is yeah. just not worth it. 
and it is, it's getting out of that cycle. It's rewiring your brain to say, no, nah, you don't need it. You're going to benefit a lot more without it. And I think that's so important for somebody like me who doesn't have that diagnosis, who isn't eligible right now in this minute in time for HRT to look at what I can do. You know, instead of crying about it all the time, it's like, no, you can change how you feel. It might, yeah. you know, it's we're not talking about kind of, osteoporosis pre pre prevention and that is the one thing that does scare me and feel like we shouldn't all say you know we can't manage it we can do a lot we can go halfway and we can do a lot but if we are in perimenopause you're saying it is so important for us you know in terms of prevention for when we're older to be on hrt it is really important and that's why it's just been a, it's a complete travesty that whole generations of women with early menopause have been have been ignored because women are um, you're much more likely to die of cardiovascular disease than breast cancer um, osteoporosis can massively contribute to morbidity and mortality but they're not scary so you, women don't tend to walk around in their 30s and 40s and even their 50s worried that they're going to get osteoporosis or they're worried they're going to get have a heart attack they worry they're going to have breast, they're going to get breast cancer yeah that's true. I've never thought about, I have never, ever worried about osteoporosis. Never. Or even the fact of what you just said, that you're more likely, women are more likely to die of a heart attack than breast cancer. I did not know that. Again, you know. So I asked my followers uh, if they had questions. Now, I got a lot and we won't get through them all. But I think um, starting first of all with uh, kind of perimenopausal questions. Um, my ADHD has gone wild. I'm 39. Is this perimenopause at play? Oh, and the chin. Whole fucking face hairs. <laughs> so first of all on the ADHD. ADHD is um, becoming much more discussed. And there does definitely seem to be a link between ADHD worsening or ADHD symptoms becoming apparent um, in the perimenopause and menopause. I've got a doctor that works in my clinic called um, Dr. Emma Ping, who literally spends her entire clinical time now seeing women in ex with exactly that scenario. Um, it's just it's it's all of a sudden people are connecting the dots. And it really... It, That's what it feels it's like. It feels a collective epiphany. It's like, oh, this is why. And this is why I just keep thinking about the women who didn't connect the dots because there was no information. Um, right, what are we doing about the chin hairs, Naomi? The face hairs, the nipple hairs, the everywhere hairs. Will HRT help us with that? Um, it's so... Hair, hairiness um, is a is a result of lots of different lots of different things and lots of different hormones. Um, using HRT doesn't normally change. So once you have a hair that has become a um, a kind of adult kind of villous hair, then it's unlikely that that is going to then change. Well, it's not going to change back to being like a fine kind of light hair. So they're it's here for good. <laughs> but there are um, cosmetic processes that can um, that, that again that's not my area of expertise yeah uh, my mental health gets worse on the lead up to my period how can I manage it so that's pretty typical so um worsening PMS um is a fairly common symptom in the perimenopause and there are all sorts of things that can be done so firstly all the lifestyle changes that we discussed yeah. um so are particularly important during that during that phase but there are other things that can be done including medications hormones um, all sorts of things depending on the clinical picture but it's definitely something that can be treated perimenopause forgetfulness is frightening me and it's really getting me down is there anything that helps Again, it is um, working out what is the what is the what is the cause of that? Is it the fact that you are so tired that you are you know you're not sleeping, um, you're anxious, and so is it the symptoms that are feeding into that, or is it just simply the lack of hormones? Um, in which case, sometimes HRT can help. But if you don't want to take or you can't take HRT, then sometimes if you actually treat the symptoms that are the cause of those of of the forgetfulness, then it, that can help in itself.
Are there any alternatives to HRT? We talked about kind of holistic methods. And loads. There's loads of, of so there's medication, so there's non-hormonal medication. So depending on what your what your symptoms are, there's we would choose a specific medication that would target um, a specific symptom. There are alter so kind of herbal alternatives, things like black cohosh sometimes have a role, St. John's Wort, all of these need to be, you know read up about and used in caution but they can they can be um be helpful um there's something called cognitive behavior therapy so cbt which is evidence-based proven to help with menopausal symptoms um things like acupuncture and massage have have their roles um so there's there's lots and yeah. lots that um, um i've got a lot of information on those kind of things on my website but it's yeah it's not hrt or nothing by any means again a common theme why do doctors not believe anxiety is caused by menopause 10 years i have been fobbed off that's really true it's the poor training um i don't i mean it is a symptom i don't know why people don't recognize it as such really because it is it definitely is uh, there's a lady asking i was 40 this year my last period was five days late and 10 days long and loads of crying faces that is what can happen in the perimenopause. So periods change. They can get longer, they can get more frequent, they can get less frequent, they can get lighter, they can get heavier. I mean, anything can anything can happen. If your periods have, have got heavier, uh, especially if you're over the age of 45, then that needs investigating. Um, but I mean, it's one of the it's one of the periods changing is one of the most bond or of everybody's periods will change because everybody's periods will stop. My ignorance around periods and why initially I didn't think I was in perimenopause was because mine's got shorter. Mine's come every two to three weeks now. I thought they had to be delayed. I thought it was just hormone fluctuations. Mine only lasts like four days now, but they come every two, two, three weeks. And now I'm only realizing that there are some women who have their periods for every two weeks. And it's because of perimenopause. Yeah. That's, that's yeah, classic symptom. <clears throat> I have been using a uh, estradiol pump and a progesterone tab. The weight has piled on. Is this normal? The weight gain is not thought to be uh, a result of HRT. So um, there is, there's all sorts of things that change in the perimenopause and menopause, including metabolism. And so so you could have had that weight gain anyway, mm. but sometimes um, it, it, if you take HRT and you feel better and you are no longer anxious, then that can cause weight gain because you were previously running at a lower weight because you were anxious and you weren't eating properly. Mm. Um, sometimes you can get fluid retention with HRT, so particularly with the with the progesterone, you can get it can it can make you feel like you put weight on when actually it's it's fluid. Okay. Uh, um, but it, but sometimes it is literally just that you were going to put that weight on anyway. So it very much depends. Here, it's it's a man's world. It is a it is. man's world, Naomi. It really, really is. But I am just blown away by the amount of people who either are more educated and informed on it now. And as I say, the feedback I get is, yep, it's shit welcome to perimenopause and they're just kind of loving life and just going on and it's like suck it up or it's people saying oh my god i've been going through this does that mean i'm in perimenopause but i'm only 35 and they're not educated and they aren't aware and then there's the other trench of women who are in menopause and maybe of an older generation who are like no you're not getting it hard you get it hard when you're in full-blown medication or full-blown menopause you're not getting it hard right now and i do feel that there's that stigma there so i do think there's collectively a lot of work to be done in terms of educating us so there's a whole host of amazing kind of menopause advocates out there and you know lisa snowden does loads of work davina does loads but there's there's a whole menopause mandate there's loads of them um and it's it's definitely changing because there's now kind of youthful, gorgeous looking women who are, you know, menopausal yeah. and they are telling everybody that you can be menopausal and you can look like you can look like me and it can happen to you. It can happen in your mid 30s, your mid 40s and obviously beyond. But again, I just want to say thank you for dedicating your whole career to it. <laughs> it's a, 
it's selfishly it's a it's a it's a brilliant job because when when patients do come to us we make them better yeah. it's easy you know we make them we make them better it's not like other branches of medicine where you kind of patch people up and they've got something with for us it, we make them better it's great i just want to say thank you for debunking my maths for coming on and, and speaking to me this is something that i never do I just thought the time was right. I thought I owed it to anybody that follows me that asks me questions. And there are not enough hours in the day for me to personally reply to everybody. And even if I could, I am not a menopause specialist like yourself. I am not an <laughs> educated on this myself either. And that's what I'm trying to do. But hopefully by putting this out there and for anybody that sees it, they know they're not alone. They know they don't have to just suck it up and move on. They know that there are actual things like osteoporosis and cardiovascular health issues that can be more prevalent if you are in perimenopause and not on HRT, which I think, as you say, it's because the likes of breast cancer and ovarian cancer are more scary. But what's not scary about dying? You know, even if it is that crumble, as you said. Yeah. So hopefully it does make women more aware. I think a lot of GPs will be cursing you um, as time goes on, Naomi, because they're getting this influx of people. Well, Dr. Naomi Potter said, I could come in and tell you about all my symptoms and that you could either refer me on to a menopause specialist or give me HRT, let's go. And that was me last week. My doctor's just like, on you go. I was like, well, do you know what? I'm, I'm gonna contact Dr. Naomi Potter. <laughs> Being unpopular as well. I don't mean it badly. I think that's that's what I could like to kind of caveat. I know I don't blame GPs at all. I've been there. I know how hard it is. Yeah. Um, but equally, I do think that it is only fair for women to have the access to what they need. It's it's um it's not right for them not to. No, and that, and that's why I love you, and that's why so many women are going to benefit, and you are. You're going to be in the Royal College of General Practitioners. You are going to change legislation. You are. You're going to do it all, and just thank you for being you. That's and on my own, it's a big, 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 big uh, team of lots of menopause warriors out there. It's by no means just me. So Naomi, thank you so so much. I really appreciate it. That's lovely. I was you. going to go and have a cup of coffee, but I'm all not can't I? Herbal tea. tea. You know what I got? I got, you know, those twinings, green tea. Have you ever had the salted caramel? No. It smells better than it tastes. Oh, yeah. It smells like you're going on for a big sticky salted caramel bump, but you're not. It's just green tea. <laughs> it's a bit of an anti-climax. If you're still here, thanks for joining us, for watching or listening wherever you are in the world. You can follow Naomi on Instagram as well as follow her menopause clinic or you can pop over to the website menopausecare.co.uk.